is my privilege to preach to you the word of our Lord as that's summarized for us in Lord's Day 13 of the Heidelberg Catechism. And there we read the following. Why is he, that is Jesus Christ, called God's only begotten Son, since we're also children of God? Because Christ alone is the eternal, natural Son of God. We, however, are children of God by adoption through grace for Christ's sake. Why do you call him our Lord? Because he has ransomed us, body and soul, from all our sins, not with silver or gold, but with his precious blood, and has freed us from all the power of the devil to make us his own possession. Following upon the preaching of God's word, we'll sing together hymn 41, verses 1, 2, and 3, which is a prayer to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, as I'm sure you're aware, the Catechism is, at this point, taking us through an exposition of the Apostles' Creed, that basic statement of faith that has served the church for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, as we're dealing with the Apostles' Creed, the Creed itself begins with God the Father, then moves to God the Son, and finally God the Spirit. And so it's very evident that we're in that section about God the Son. In dealing with what we confess concerning Jesus Christ, the Catechism has first explained for us the, the names and the titles given to Jesus Christ. And that brings us to two titles in Lord's Day 13, that are often used in Scripture to describe the Lord Jesus. He is called the only begotten Son of God, and He is also called our Lord. And we need to realize when we reflect upon these things this afternoon that how we think about Jesus Christ also very much reflects on how we think of ourselves. The real confession of Christ as God's Son and of our Lord has therefore a direct practical outworking in our lives, how we view ourselves, how we conduct ourselves. And we want to explore this afternoon this confession from both those angles. And so I've entitled the sermon this afternoon, Exploring Our Confession of Christ. And we'll look firstly, of course, then, of Christ as God's only begotten Son, and secondly, as our Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> what I want to do with you this afternoon, firstly, is to go to John's Gospel. And I would invite you to open the beginning of the Gospel of John with me. What we want to do is to read the first number of verses from this gospel as if we were reading them for the very first time, as if we didn't know anything about the gospel of John. But we've picked up this book and we're eager to hear what the Apostle John has to say about Jesus Christ in this book, this gospel. And as we pick it up, we read it fresh. So we're trying to imagine reading it for the first time, not knowing what's coming up. 
in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. That's kind of a really confusing way to begin a book. It's a bit of a riddle, really. We've got this Word. We don't yet know what this Word is. It's, it's there right in the beginning, and it's with God, but it's also God Himself. Verse 2. He, but then, that's already betraying a prior knowledge of what's coming up. You could just as easily translate the Greek, it, the word, was in the beginning with God. Now we move on. All things were made through, and then literally in the Greek, through the word. That's what's being referred to. We don't yet know what kind of a person this word might be, or whether it's an it, a he, she, whatever. All things were made through this word, and without it was not anything made that was made. Now we're beginning to perhaps clue on to uh, that maybe John is talking about Genesis 1. After all, time and again in Genesis 1, what do we read? God said a word, and it's a statement of God, and it happens. Again and again, right throughout Genesis 1, that's what you get. God speaks a word, and it happens. Things get created. Verse 4. In him, and again in the Greek, we're referring back to this word. We don't yet really know that it isn't him, a him. In it was life. The life was the, the light of men. You've got to think of the fact that when you, when you see human beings, and, and this in ancient times was a, a real telltale sign of life, that you see light in the eyes of people. In this word was life, we're told. Life was the light of men. Well, again, if we think back to Genesis 1, indeed, things are created and not just trees and shrubs and light and, and a separation of waters, but life is created by this word in Genesis 1. Animals are created, birds, fish, and even mankind. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Literally, has not grasped it. Literally grasping it. Of course, darkness just can't grasp light, but perhaps also metaphorically grasped in the sense of comprehending it. And then John changes topic, as it were. We get a new paragraph. We've had this bit of a riddle. We change gears. There was a man. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness, to be a witness about this light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to be a witness about this light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And so we're seeing a link back to verse 4. In this word was life, we were told, and the life, that was the, the light of men. And now when John's talking about John the Baptist, he's telling us that John the Baptist wasn't the light himself, but he came to be a witness about it, and this light gives light to everyone. 
This light, verse 10, and once again, we don't know that it's a he, and the Greek doesn't reveal that to us yet. This light was in the world, and the world was made through it, yet the world did not know him. Now here, at the end of verse 10, for the very first time, it becomes clear that this word, this light that we're talking about, is not an it, but very much a him. That's the first time that John, in his Greek, makes that crystal clear. The world did not know him. So, we're looking for a person who is this, this creating word and this light. A person who will have a name. We're told he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he's got a name thus, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, if you're reading this gospel for the first time, you don't know yet that John's talking about Jesus. You've got to work that out as he goes. But now you know he's talking about somebody with a name. and Somebody who came to his own. Someone who gives us the right to be called children of God. who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Then the puzzle pieces in the following few verses begin to fall into place. And the word, says John, so obviously he's talking about verse 1, that word that was in the beginning with God and was God, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son, or perhaps more literally, the only begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John, that is John the Baptist, bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we've all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through, and here we get it, Jesus Christ. No one's ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Or if you've got a New King James the only begotten Son who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. And so you see, John slowly builds up a puzzle. If you didn't read this before, if you didn't know about the Gospel of John, the beginning is a real puzzle. And as you go along, slowly it begins to make a little bit more sense until the clinching at the very end where we're told, yes, there's this word, this creating word that's been with God, there was in the beginning, this light. It became flesh. It's got a name. He is Jesus Christ. What has John been belaboring here? That when you call Jesus Christ the Son of God, that's not some kind of fancy name for a king. Many kings, you know, in ancient times called themselves son of God. It's much more than that, says John. When you hear Jesus called son of God, you must think of a special relationship that he has with the Father. He was with God. He was that word by which the Father spoke and all things were created. 
And this was the very point of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, as John tells us that, at the second Passover. That is to say, about a year into Jesus' ministry, when Jesus came down from Galilee to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. You know, John's Gospel is famous for telling us about what Jesus taught and said, mostly at those feasts in Jerusalem, something that the, the other Gospels really hardly say anything about, except for the very last week of Jesus. And at that Passover, John describes that in, in chapter 5, Jesus really made a point of ramming home his personal connection with the Father. He deliberately provoked the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees. He deliberately healed somebody on the Sabbath in the pool of Bethesda. He didn't tell the person who he was, and he disappears straight away because he knew what was going to happen. This guy that's just been healed, he's told him to pick up his mattress and go home. Well, if he walks with a mattress in Jerusalem, you know what's going to happen. The Pharisees forbid that, like that's breaking the Sabbath for them. And, of course, they pick him up. And they ask him, who did this to you? Now, of course, later in the day, Jesus reveals himself to that fellow. And this fellow then runs off to tell the Pharisees, it was Jesus. And they come to Jesus. What are you doing? Well, Jesus makes it only worse. He says this, my father is working until now, and I'm working. And we're told this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And here comes a challenge. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. You see, Jesus has done a few miracles up till now. The people know that he can heal. He's been healing up north in Galilee. He's just healed that fellow, even if it was on the Sabbath. But get what Jesus says now. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. It's all very well to heal people and do miracles. Giving life is what God does. Jesus claims that very special relationship with God, his unique Father. You see, it's especially the Gospel of John that makes clear that believing in the name of Jesus is more than just confessing uh, Jesus is the Messiah. In other words, Jesus is the anointed king, the one that's going to rule our nation. He says, no, believing in the name of Jesus also means accepting that Jesus is the unique, only begotten Son of God in the fullest sense of that term. And that is a massive confession. As one, you could ask yourself, how do you get your head around it? And you know, even later on, when the apostles are sent out to preach to all the nations, that remains a point that needs time and time to be emphasized and to be thought about. Who is this Jesus Christ? More than just the King of Israel, the Messiah. I'm going to reflect on how Paul, in a nutshell, describes the gospel at the beginning of his letter to the Romans. He says this, Paul, a, a servant, literally a slave, of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Well, what's the gospel about? Here's what he tells. Concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared 
to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In other words, for the Apostle Paul, it's by the fact that Jesus Christ got resurrected to eternal life that you can see the proof that He truly is Son of God. We, on the other hand, are not children of God in that sense. We, as John said, and we read in chapters 12, uh, sorry, verses 12 and 13 of chapter 1, we are sons of God by adoption. Right? But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, in other words, not naturally, nor of the will of man, but of God. We're adopted as children. This was also the point that Jesus was making with Nicodemus when he talked about him concerning regeneration, being born again by the Spirit. Because when you're born again by the Spirit, you become adopted, you become God's child. Well, what are the practical implications of this? Number one, brothers and sisters, that we need to remember that God's fatherhood of us is an act of grace. It is emphatically not the case that every single human being on this planet can call God Father. No. God has adopted those human beings on this planet who believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, to be His children. That's God's grace. We don't deserve it. We deserve only condemnation for having turned our backs on God after the fall into sin of our first parents. But the second thing we then need to realize, if God has adopted us, and we're given the privilege of addressing Him as our Father, then we need to also remember that God is the one who defines what fatherhood is, what it's all about, what the implications are of calling God Father. You know, there was a time, I don't know if you remember that, it was, in the, it was a while ago, in the 1970s really, when it was popular in many evangelical churches to, to go around saying, well, we get to call God Daddy. And you know, people were arguing this word Abba, an Aramaic word, was some kind of uh, way that people back then called their dads daddy, which of course has since been proved to be nonsense, but it was in vogue. When you read scripture and you, you ask yourself, how does scripture deal with God as father, it becomes clear that that fatherhood of God implies great respect. It also implies that he gives himself a duty of care over us. In other words, God says, if I'm going to be your father, that means I am promising to provide for you, to care for you. And that this care that I am promising to give you is motivated by the love of a father. Think only of how that's expressed in Psalm 103. God is a father caring for his children. And so God says, if I'm your heavenly father, you can take comfort from that. 
that gives your life a kind of stability that it would not otherwise have, that there is a Father over you caring for you. Yes, Jesus Christ is unique. He's God's only begotten Son. There is no other. That's the point of that word, only or only begotten. Not that Jesus was, at a certain point of time, actually, physically begotten, but that he is unique. The only natural Son of God. But we've been given by God's grace, that adoption as sons, whereby we also can have that comfort and that feeling of stability in life of a Father that is almighty and has promised to care for us through thick and thin. Whatever happens, His fatherly love and care for us is always going to be there. For we adopted, we are adopted by virtue of that faith, that belief in the name of His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's just like small children. Even though you might as a family go through great danger and economic difficulties or whatever, kids are just going to keep having that faith in Dad because, well... He's the greatest, and he will always see us through. And that's that faith, that comfort, that stability that we can feel and experience through faith when we truly realize God in Jesus Christ is and has promised to be my Father. Jesus in that sense, calls himself our brother, as is expressed literally in Hebrews chapter 2. Well, we come then to the second part of our confession this afternoon. Jesus is God's only begotten Son, but we also call him our Lord. And here you see something, brothers and sisters, of the balance in Scripture. Balance because there's more than one way of viewing God and the Lord Jesus Christ. More than one metaphor is used to describe that relationship because it is a complex, multifaceted relationship that we have. Jesus, you see, is not just big brother. He is also, at the same time, our Lord. Now, that word Lord, particularly in ancient times, implies ownership, master. And it's even as the Catechism has already explained to us in Lord's Day 1 and reiterates even now in Lord's Day 13, he's our Lord because he has purchased us. Literally, bought us back. That's what ransomed means. He's ransomed us, bought us back. That word is used many times in Scripture. It's where we get the word redemption from. Buying back. You know, when you are so poor that you have to pawn something off at a, at a pawn shop. I forget what they call them in, uh, in this country. But you have a, a month or so in which you can come back and buy your goods back from that person. Plus interest, of course. You redeem your goods. In the same way, Jesus Christ has redeemed us, bought us back, but not with money, not with silver or gold. He bought us with his own blood. He purchased us back to be reconciled to God the Father. That was the whole point. And the only price that could be paid for that was his blood because God's justice requires that his intense wrath against sin, sin that, that offends his holiness, could only be stilled and quieted by an appropriate punishment. It's that punishment 
the blood, the life that Jesus Christ paid to buy us back. Now, if he bought us, think about it, then he is saying he owns us. He's our Lord, in other words, our master, owner. That makes us, in a very real sense, slaves. Time and again, in, in our English translations, when the apostles at the beginning of their letters call themselves slaves of Jesus Christ, like Romans 1 we just had, it's translated servant. Why do they do that? Well, they do that because, of course, the word slave in our time has a very negative connotation. Because when we think slave, oh, most people just think a couple of hundreds of years ago of Negro slavery in the Americas, for example, is very well known and a great abuse of slavery. They're not thinking of slavery as it was in ancient Israel. A totally separate concept. Slave does mean that the master owns you. You belong to him. But at the same time in Israel, that gives you a duty of care. You are to be cared for, housed. You are to be looked after, even in your older age. That's the duty of the owner. You belong to him. And of course, if we understand the price that Jesus Christ had to pay for us, you understand his great love that motivated this purchase. You see, we were destined for eternal imprisonment by God, together with the devil, for our sins. And Jesus bought us out of that damnation so that we could belong to him. The Catechism when it reflects on this, reflects not so much on the duties that go along for Jesus Christ as our owner, but on our responsibility, our duties also towards Him. If we are belonging to Jesus Christ as His slaves, the number one duty of a slave is obedience. And in this case, of course, the obedience that's required of us is not just doing things. It's a heartfelt obedience. Even as our owner, Jesus Christ, motivated by love, let himself die on a cross so that we could belong to him. Paul himself talks about the obedience of faith in that same passage from Romans that I read from. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and mine, you are making that humble confession that you were destined for hell and he bought you out of that with his own blood, with his life. Now at the beginning of this sermon, brothers and sisters, I said how you look at Jesus Christ is going to reflect on how you look at yourself. And I hope that's become clear. If you see Jesus as the unique and the only begotten Son of God, but realize then that God has adopted us also to be His children, then we have a very close relationship with Jesus Christ. As our brother. Not on the same level, but certainly equally children of God. But if we also at the same time are addressing Jesus Christ as our Lord, and we also realize what a duty of obedience we have to him for the love that motivated him to give his life to buy us for himself and to reconcile us to his heavenly Father and to make that adoption possible. And so in the morning when we get up and we say our morning prayers to God, 
I think it's a good idea often to motivate those prayers by reflecting also in prayer to God as to where we stand before him. Yes, he's going to be our father this day. And look over us and care for us. But equally, we belong to his son and have a duty of obedience to him. And if it's to him, then it's also to God the Father. And that implies loyalty. Loyalty to God. Triune. First and foremost in our lives. And if we begin the day reflecting on these things, then we begin the day on the right foot, understanding that this confession of faith, that believing in Jesus Christ must, if it's a real faith, have a genuine impact on the attitudes that we have during the day to others, to God, and to ourselves. Let us then take this confession. Let us work with it because it is a great treasure.